Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the study this morning. We're going to uh, continue looking at these lines where we were yesterday. So if you can just join me in a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for this morning, and we ask for your spirit's presence here. We ask for a clear mind and an understanding heart. I ask, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit can guide and direct us in this study, in these important lines that address our time, and that as we follow this um, this principle of line upon line that you have given us in your word, uh, that we can see clearly how to distinguish the, these lines, not just for our curiosity, but so that we can have light for our feet and that we can be uh, directed in sharing these truths with others. We ask for your angels to always be around us, for your Holy Spirit to speak to the hearts of those that we speak to, that you can speak through us. And we pray for each person who is struggling to understand these truths. Be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> good, good morning again, everyone. So I'm still kind of waking up, so my mind isn't as clear as I would like. But uh, that's just the reality happens sometimes. Now, um, yesterday we had introduced this idea that uh, I think is going to take a little bit of time to, uh, to sort of go through. Because when we're looking at Gideon, so we're studying now Gideon in the book of Judges, we have six, uh, three chapters, chapters six, seven, and eight. And these three chapters, each one of them we have recognized as a line. Though when we drew out the lines uh, a few months ago, we did not um, we did not mark those lines. You know, the arrival of the first angel, the formalization, etc. Uh, we had come to the conclusion that Judges six was basically addressing eleven nine. And that Judges 7 was addressing uh, July 18. And that Judges 8 was addressing December 25th, 2021. That is, it was looking at a line that we have, which is the, the 777 structure. Now, in doing that, we felt that we had skipped a step. And that step was to recognize that Gideon is actually the, the 777 structure itself. So what we did um, over the last couple of studies is uh, we took Gideon and we created this 777 structure for all of Gideon, for 6, 7, and 8. But what we, we didn't do yet is we haven't gone through and shown how each of those way marks is represented in chapter six, seven, and eight. And so that's one thing that we were going to do uh, yesterday. But instead, yesterday, we recognized that there is a separate line of in that 777 structure uh, with different way marks, at least a few different way marks. And those way marks have to do with the formalization and the empowerment of the first angel and the formalization and empowerment of the second angel. So again, we're going to have to be able to go through these passages here in Judges 6, 7, and 8 and apply them in two different ways. And then we discussed, well, how can we, how can we justify that we have two different lines over the same period of time? And, and what was our reason for justifying the idea that we can do that, if anybody remembers. Why can we, why should we be able to create two different lines, two different scenarios? And the best answer was, do we remember? 
Because the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So why could we create two different lines in, in the story of Gideon? Isn't it because we can see a literal and a spiritual application? Okay, no. So that wasn't what we were doing. We we didn't decide that there's a literal and a spiritual. That, I mean, one is, in order for them to, there to be two different lines, that means there has to be two different darknesses that are being addressed, that are separate darknesses. And and one one answer we had is that well there's two classes so we have the foolish and the wise but the other thing that we have is we have two different messages that this movement has attached to the 777 structure and that is the message of July 18 and the message of Donald Trump right okay so so that is, of course, going to be manifest in these lines that we've seen is that there are these two um, presentations. One is Odilios and one is uh, Collins. And those are going to be much more uh, uh, parsed out when we, we get to uh, um, Samson. Right. So we're going to see those really, really clearly, but they, but they exist in these lines. And now the thing about, uh, so here, I'm just going to go back. I, I wanted to sort of start reading the verses, but this is helpful to look at the lines themselves. So one of the things we see about the line of Gideon, um, when we look at this, these lines here is that they're going to end all of them at January 11th, the 12th verse, uh, verse in the year 2023, right? So they all come to our time. And that's because we've understood the book of Judges goes from 9 11 to 2023. And that's based on Judges chapter 2. And then we have um, each of these lines um, is these different chapters. So we said that this is basically looking at the issues related to uh, uh, November 9th, and the next one's the issues related to July 18th. And this one is related to what, what happens in the movement on December 25th, 2021. So, so in these lines, the, the, the main focus is moving from from the events that precede November 9th to some degree, that is in the second line. Um, but it's really about November 9th. But this what this line, these lines here don't end on December 25th, 2021, except this second line, chapter seven. Um, but they go further. They go to a, an arrival of the third angel in 2023, if we take this first line as each one of these lines has seven waymarks. And so we could draw out those waymarks, which we haven't done yet for those lines. But when we look at the line of Gideon itself, it just goes to December 25th, 2021. But of course, we know that when we have a line, we can zoom into the different waymarks. So we're saying that chapter six, seven, and eight are a zoom into the arrival of the first angel, the arrival of the second angel, and the arrival of the third angel. Yet all of them, when we zoom into them with those chapters, all of them are going to lead us to 2023, but the line of Gideon itself doesn't in either of these examples that we have set here. It's not going to bring us to 2023. But one thing we can say is that December 25th, has in it that 2023 date, but only when we zoom into it. And actually, when we zoom into either one of these waymarks, it's going to bring us to 2023. But the line of Gideon itself, when it's put into the 77 seven, seven, seven structure, doesn't directly give us the 2023 date. 
So it becomes something that that happens when we zoom into the line of Gideon. So this line of Gideon, this is basically how Jeff would have looked at the line if he had addressed Gideon in the way that we're studying it, based on how, when we examine the foundation, how he understood Gideon even prior to July 18th. But once we look at how he applied Gideon, the 300, to July 18th, uh, we can see how we can create these, these lines. But now we have two different lines. So when we're going through Judges 6, 7, and 8, as we're going to start to do, um, we're going to have to recognize that we are going to be creating two separate lines with the same story that follow the same path that, that illustrate these different way marks. Now, um, another way we can look at it, it that that is kind of um, well, when we look at a line, normally you have a group of people that's being tested, right? That in in the first message, and that group of people in that first message have to accept that first first message in order to be tested or receive the second message, correct? Yes. Now, we, we don't always draw that out in the line. I mean, we do in Millerite history. We do in, um, you know, in our history. Um, and, and But I know that when we've done the decrees, I've never drawn that out. I've never said, you know, who's tested by the first message, who's tested by the second. But we, we could probably think it through and, and realize uh, that the second message is testing uh, uh a group of people that has accepted the first message. Those are the ones that left Babylon. Yet we have a problem with the story of Esther, where you have people who haven't left Babylon. Uh, but those people who haven't left Babylon, they're in a sense being called out of Babylon in the second message. So, so we'd have to try to understand how that works. But uh, And then there's a group of people that received the third angel's message. Right. So the third message, of course, is going to be those people that uh, had been called out of Jerusalem. And yet you're going to have in both uh, the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, people who are actually not in Jerusalem at the time when they're called to give a message. So that's another interesting aspect of that story of the decrees that we've never addressed that I know of. Um, but here in. In this message, we know that um, that the people being tested are people in this message. But if we have two separate lines, that this, this would apply that there's two separate group, groups being tested, um, even under the first angel. That is, it's not the same group of people being tested. And one of the things we can see about this line, especially when we look at um, this line on the bottom, uh, I mean, it has... A connection to the Adventist church. And it's also a much more external line. So if you're going to say literal and, and figurative, I would say that in some ways, this line here of Gideon at the top would be completely internal. Right? But this line at the bottom is an external line. Um, to the degree that it's, you know, this 100 days of prayer is the Adventist church. And this December 25th, the bombing of Nashville and uh, um, January 6th, these are much more uh, public events than what we see in this line. And the fact that we gave a message regarding July 18th, this was a message to warn people outside of our movement, right? So this is a public message and this one is not. Does that make sense? I would think so. Okay. 
So um, now we would normally describe um, internal and external, I guess, is how we would look at a line like this. That would be the words that we would use. And so when we go through this story of Gideon, uh, we will see that there is an internal and an external. And, and those will be part of the things that we, we try to address. Um, now, even though we have different way marks here, right, different, well, we have the same way marks, but different events, um, you could have in the story of Gideon, one event representing the same uh, way mark in, in a line above, right? So it doesn't mean we need something, even though we haven't looked at it yet. Uh, we can then say, well, if we have some something in the story of Gideon, let's say it's going to represent the second angel arriving in this line, that same event could represent the second angel arriving in this line. Now, in this line, of course, they're both the same date, at least how we have them written here, though there might be uh, something that's slightly different about this line and this line and on that July 18th date. Um, but we, and, and we'll see that why I'm saying that in, when we get through that, but if, if that's true, I could also say that June 27th and July 4th could have in the story of Gideon, the same event, but it's going to mark, for instance, the empowerment of the first angel, but it's a different event in an internal line than it is in an external line and so the dates show up differently but it doesn't necessarily mean and we'll see how this works out because i haven't worked it all through yet we'll see how this works out um is there anything significant about 6 27 20 so july 27 20 are you asking about the number or about that date like as far as an event uh, that's our date. I, I don't know if we touched on that I'm drawing a blank here. Okay, so June 27th is 1260 days from uh, January 14th, 20, 2017. So that's when Jeff is okay. going to give this message. I remember. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and then the 200. Yeah, okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. And then it's going to be uh, uh, 273 days to March 27th. 2021. So now one of the things about having this June 27th date on this line is we don't have March 27th, 2021 or January 14th, 2017 on this line. And yet we have this June 27th date. But what, what I was arguing why this was the empowerment um, because as we were moving to July 18th, as because we're having this message, of course, about July 18th, and we have this first message. When we were moving toward that message, it was part of the thing that was empowering this message, at least, had to do with the understanding of the pandemic and the role that that January 14th, 2017 uh, presentation had in connection with uh, Panium and, and or Rafi, Rafi, Rafi and Panium with the pandemic in between. But also it was giving us light about the message to the Levites. Now, to some degree, um, even though I see this as an empowerment, um, this June 27th date, and there was this, um, and this is one thing I guess we would have to examine once we look at at the story of the judges of, of Gideon itself in, the, in Judges, that this 21 days, the significance of this 21 days that I called attention to, which was pretty much ignored uh, within the movement. Now, I can say that um, the January 14th, I mean, the, the presentation that Jeff did, one of the presentations, the main one where he talked about the pandemic, was put up on. Uh, the School of the Prophets website, their YouTube page. Um, so it was it was marked by them. So they obviously paid some attention to that. 
but that 126 and the 273 becoming the 1533. Now, if we think into Millerite history, um, this is an acknowledgement of the 1533, then that goes from April, uh, April, August 11th, 1840, to October 22, 1844. So that's the 1533 symbol, um, because that's that's the empowerment of the first angel. So having that 1533 tied together with this June 27th date, this, this becomes something internal within this movement, but we don't have an event on June 27th that I know of, right? So, so putting this here, of course, creating these lines, these are, are somewhat tentative, um, though we can see the logic of, of a lot of this, especially the June 21st to 22, going to December 25th, 2020, the 187 days counted either cardinally or ordinally. Um, and that December 25th, 2020 date, of course, being uh, the bombing of Nashville, right? Uh, so, so there is, but in this line, so this one's going to deal with the bombing of Nashville. So this is going to be dealing with the July 18 event. That's why this line exists as a separate line from this one, because this is going to be about Trump. But even when it's about Trump, it's interesting that it also has these week of prayers or the, the 10 days of prayer uh, that's going to be connected to January 6th to 16th and the 100 days of prayer uh, that's going to be connected to the pandemic and these periods of 13 days. And yet we're saying that this is these are external events that are witnessing to the movement. So obviously these lines both happen at the same time but they're illustrating different aspects of the message. And there's still things that we, we don't fully understand about these lines, these two lines. So anyway, that's, that's the way that uh, we put those up. But now we're going to go to the scriptures. And of course, we, we've drawn out all of these events and all of these symbols from the story of Gideon. So we're going to go back here to chapter six and just do a really brief summary of this. So we know in chapter six that this is going to be addressing um, uh, this period of time prior to 11-9 and, and also before uh, 9 11, in the sense that we have this message of Jeff. This is the foundation of the message. This is during that period of darkness, a prophet is raised up, and we're being um, under this Midianite oppression for seven years. So we have this symbol. We talked a bit about how this relates to the judges as being. Um, uh, fulfilled in part in the time of the judges. And then we also addressed a, a bigger problem, which was when we took this whole line of literal Israel, that the judges, we didn't create them as one of the waymarks on that line, that the judges occurred uh, between the waymark of Moses and the waymark of or whether we call that Moses or the Exodus. And, um, the, the way Mark of, uh, of David or Saul, David and Solomon. So that is the United Kingdom. And so we have this period of judges that's kind of, even though we have all of these reform lines, it's not a major reform line that's on those seven reform lines that occur with literal Israel. And literal Israel is, of course, a, a reform. A, a, a way mark on that big line, the cosmic line. So we have the cosmic line, right? And in that cosmic line, we have uh, literal Israel, right? And then we take the line of literal Israel and we take all the major reform lines, but the judges is not there. It just, it's a period of time. It's in a sense, it's a period of darkness. Every man did that, which was right in his own eyes, right? That's, that's sort of the judges to some degree, 
But then we're, we're going to have this darkness. And during that period of time, all of these judges are going to be raised up as they're being uh, oppressed by these various uh, powers. Some of them enemies that were left in the land. Some of them are relatives, um, uh, you know, tribes that are related to them. And then some even with internal within their own 12 tribes, they're going to have these, these battles or these conflicts. And so that's where the period of judges occurs. And we're saying that, ju that, that the period of judges represents from September 11th uh, to September 11th to 2023. Now, now, if we look at it that way, as, as we've been doing, um, we, we just have had trouble distinguishing what line we're talking about. So we've taken the position that, that the judges is a zoom into a way mark that we call the arrival of the second angel's message. It's not a zoom into 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel's message. And that's because it, it has to do with this movement. So, so, um, so we're saying that, that that's what judges is, right? That's what the story of the judges is. And yet within that, we have all of these other reform lines, all these different judges, uh, they come in and bring about this reform. And so those are going to represent uh, that zoom in to that arrival of the second angel, which is um, a way mark on a line that, that we have called September 11th, but in some ways is also other dates as well. So it, it, it's we're, we're getting close to be able to separate out these lines. The, the goal is that we can clearly see what line we're in when we're talking about an event or a waymark and its significance. We can say we're in this line. In this line, such and such an event represents such and such a waymark in relationship to uh, a certain period of darkness. It's, it's addressing a certain... Uh, understanding of light because we need and, and why do we need that why do we need to understand these lines in this way why couldn't we just be happy with what we had before what what are these lines the understanding of these lines is doing for this movement I know God is giving us light each day. And I mean, I can read the Bible. I can read, read inspired stuff. And every time I do, I learn something new. Okay. So, I mean, we're studying the Bible and we're, we're getting to know the Bible in much more detail than we ever thought possible. But for this movement, the understanding of the lines, what is it? Why is it necessary for this movement at this time? Why do we need to be doing what we've been doing? What particular uh, point needs to be understood about the lines and why? What part, part are we playing? You know, like we need to know how we fit in what's, what's occurring right now. Now, what role do we have in this, these final days? Okay. Yeah. So, so one is we need to know what, what our job is, what our responsibility is. And, and this has been a, a struggle, I think, within the movement for a long time that has been, um, I don't think that people have really had an answer to that. There's, there would be lots of different answers. And we can even think back to uh, what happened in 2014 with the separation that occurred within the movement and, Part of that separation was about public evangelism. You know, what is this movement supposed to be doing? What is its responsibility? What is its work? And there, there was those that left that believed that we needed to be evangelizing. 
and, and many of them were evangelists. That's the work that they wanted to be doing was have evangelistic series and keep bringing people into this movement um, separate from the church. And, and in some ways, um, you know, Parminder and Tabo, even though they had accepted the idea of no public evangelism, uh, they were still planning to create a church that we were going to be calling people into and and into out of the Adventist church was their message where that wasn't so much the role of, of the other groups. They are thinking just going out to the world. Um, but part of that was a conflict of what is our, our role? What do these lines mean? And where are we in these lines so that we know what we are to do? Now, if we think about what's presently occurring in the movement, um, and, and I did a simplification of it uh, at the end of, I don't think it was yesterday, but maybe it was, um, just dealing with Odilio and, and um, Colin's lines, but especially with Odilio, what he's thinking, because his line addresses July 18th. Um, but both Colin and Odilio are addressing uh, the Sunday law, how it's going to look, what the present events, the pandemic, and the situation politically with Trump, how these are relating to um, what's going to be coming right away. And the idea is that that Sunday law is coming right away and we, we have a particular way of looking at it, that it has to do with the pandemic and it has to do with Trump. And yet we can see that the lines are showing us that that's not the case, that Trump is not gonna be president when the Sunday law comes in and the pandemic is not going to be the issue. But these these occurred, Trump and 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 the pandemic, under a type of the Sunday law that exists within our line. So we can see then, if we don't understand the lines correctly, we're going to have a distorted idea of our responsibility, what we should be doing, and also uh, what that message is. And we have seen that the message that's coming to this movement right now is the call to the upper room. that until we come to the upper room, we can't know what our message is. We can't know what our mission is. We can't know what our responsibility is. Because right now the present responsibility is one of repentance and confession, correct? Amen, exactly. And, and this was really the message of Jeff when he talked about no public evangelism. Can we agree with that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Colin, and I, <clears throat> Colin and I have since talked about this re-election of Trump thing. And I guess a couple of months ago, I'm not exactly sure it was, and I told him, I said, I just don't see how Trump could reassume his status in the White House. It just isn't going to happen. I said, there's a very strong possibility that that those who want Trump back in will elect him as president again, and then there will be a civil war. He will never occupy the U.S. as it was because the U.S. the USA is passé. The, the, the globalists have taken it. They have ambushed us. So with the last time I talked to him, it was only a few days ago, he said, yes, I agree with you. Now, he has lines showing what he and I had talked about, he says, he says, yeah, I, I can see your viewpoint and what is going to happen is and what you said is extremely plausible. And then just as it was in Lincoln's time, you know, the, the uh, Civil War period, it's going to recur. And I see it coming here, too. I mean, it's very, very plain. It is prophesied and it is definitely going to happen. We are under already the new world order and people need to need to realize this. And that's what I've been trying to to share as much as I can. Christ is coming. I don't know when, but extremely soon. The new world order is already gaining more and more foothold. And, and, and we have not been following what's going on with who and so forth. You know, okay. we have completely lost yeah. our sovereignty. All nations have that signed on to that so-called treaty. Yeah. So so one thing, you know, to say about that, we already understood that January 6th, um, 
2021 was the end of the United States. Right? Yes, That's, that was a coup de grace. You could... Yeah, so, so we should have, as a movement, understood that, and then we should have been able to see what's coming. Now, um, now we spent some time, because we have this 2030 date, right, April 5th, 2030, which um, we don't know what it means. But one thing in examining that, we examined um, the globalists and um, what they're trying to do. Now, my view is that what's happening is a destruction of society. So it's a dissolution of the old order. And then um, the new world order is, I mean, even though you have all of these different um, groups or people with different ideas um, trying to control the world in with their vision, their their ideology. Um, we know from Bible prophecy that really out of this, the United States is going to be the leader and it's going to be the leader that is going to basically, I mean, it conquers to some degree the globalists. It doesn't become the globalists, right? So there's there has to be a civil war in the United States. And in the civil war in the United States, we know that the king of the north wins, right? But it's not the United States anymore when it wins, right? It's now Protestantism overcoming the globalists because the globalists are the king of the south. They came and they conquered. We were looking about Russia and the United States, but we, we understood that, and this is a whole other study, but we understood in, in studying um revelation 17 and well 12 13 and 17 in the study of the presidents that um what ends up happening is we have uh that the globalists conquered the united states on january 6 2021 but that's the king of the south that's that's the raffia it's not the raffia but it's it's, it's raffia in the sense of applying that the king of the south, what we were looking for was, was that Russia was going to conquer the United States, so to speak. Russia was going to beat the U.S., right? But then the U.S. would come and destroy Russia. But that's because we believe that Russia was still the king of the south. But... But I made the argument that Russia is no longer the king of the South. And, and this is what Jeff was teaching, that Russia was the king of the South. Um, because we know when the Soviet Union fell, Russia still survived. And so the idea was that the flood came, but it only came up to the neck. But the head was left. But the head wasn't Russia, was it? What was the head of the king of the South? Is, doesn't that have to do with the ideology itself? Yes, indeed. And, and, and it moved to the UN, in, in even though it was always kind of there. But now the UN or the globalists, they still existed, but in a different form. With the fall of the Soviet Union, that, that actually increased the power of the United Nations. Right? Because during the Cold War, the really the two powers were the United States and the Soviet Union. But now the UN comes in and takes that role. The globalists begin their work after the fall of the Soviet Union of really uniting that globalist agenda, forming it, developing it. Um, and, and so that, that whole socialist agenda now has taken over the rest of the world. So Russia... It wasn't about Russia. It was about this globalist agenda. And that globalist agenda has conquered the United States. And that's illustrated by what happened on January 6, 2021. You know, it's it's connected to Trump actually losing the election. And then this, the, basically the establishment, the media and everything, um, accepting that Trump lost the election. 
And Trump can't win that election. It's not about an election. The only way that that, and it's not even about Trump now, because it's about a principle or an understanding that exists in de- with this, this idea of the Republic of the United States. And so we're going to have a conflict between these two powers, Protestantism. But Protestantism in this apostate form is going to conquer the, glo- the globalists. Right? So that's the civil war that has been going on. This is America is in a civil war. It doesn't have to become a bloody civil war for it to be a civil war. Um, though it will become a, a bloody civil war at some point. And in some ways it has. I mean, there's been a lot of deaths. Just it's not it's not like the civil war fought in 1863. And that's not even a typical civil war. What happened in 1863. A lot of other civil wars are much shorter than that. And you know, they occur and often we call them a coup or something like that. But that's when a country, you know, fights against itself. Now, in that case, we know that um, we can look at what happened in 1863 and you can have uh, the king of the south there is, is the democratic controlled part of the United States. And then and there and we can see how that's connected with Nashville and everything that happened in Nashville is connected with uh, the Democrats and all those those ideas, uh, uh, racist ideas, and that you have the king of the north uh, being uh, the re- basically Republican. And so we can see the, how that happened, how that's been going on for quite a long time in the United States, with you now Trump being the, the person there. But we know that when we we move past Trump, that Greece... Greece defeats Persia, right? Xerxes uh, goes up against Greece and loses. And, and so that's the history that we're in, if we're going to look at that story of Daniel, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. So when it comes to uh, whoever is in charge, I don't know if that really is something we even know right now, but at the end of this, and an apostate Protestant, apostate Republican, United States will rise in opposition to globalism and destroy it, but it's also going to destroy it by, by uniting with it, right? Because the United States, they reach their hand across the abyss or the gulf, Ellen White actually switches them around in, in her statements and grasps hands with the papacy. And we can see that that's happening, that's happening in the history connected with 1989 and the fall of the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union, the principle behind it is globalism, socialism. And then the United States is going to grasp hands with this this other power that's going to be the dragon power, what we call often spiritualism. And in that threefold union, that's where the Sunday law comes about. So we don't quite understand the details of it, but we know that in the history that we're in right now, that this is the history of the Sunday law. Ever since 1989, ever since Daniel 11, verse 40b, we're in the history of the Sunday law. And that's that history really dealing with November 9th, 1989. But we know that 11.9 and 9.11 and 11.9 are all the same way, Mark. We're just, we've been zoomed into that Sunday law way, Mark. Since Daniel 11, verse verse 40b was fulfilled, and we have these three dates, 11, 9, 89, 9, 11, 2001, and 11, 9, 2019, that really are all the same way mark. That is, they're all the same symbol. But we've been zooming into that. But this is all the Sunday law. 
right? So there is, if, if we're going to understand what's coming, so what Angela talked about, all these different powers and so forth. Now, now Jeff made a statement, um, and this was in uh, his first presentation um, in the, at the Oklahoma camp meeting, so in 2010. And, and he basically what he said is that we're wasting our time trying to figure out what the, you know, the, what the Illuminati or the Freemasons or whatever powers, whatever conspiracy theory we're looking at to try to figure out what's going to happen. We're, we're wasting our time. We're getting caught in a trap. I'm sort of paraphrasing. Um, of, of spending time on something that's not going to help us at all. And, you know, I understand because I've, I've studied these things ever since I was an Adventist, even before, about what's happening with these different uh, organizations that have been raised up, the globalists and, and all these different, we didn't call them globalists back then, but, but you know, socialism and, and uh, what happened with the Illuminati and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so we have all of this, you know, we, and Jeff used the word conspiracy theories that are a waste of our time, that we need to understand something, the work that we have to do, because these events are going to unfold in ways that we can't anticipate. So if we understand these lines, what we will knew, know is our present duty. And if we do our present duty, do we have any fear for the future? Because how do we understand our present duty? We have nothing to fear for keeping current. Yes, except as we forget how he's led us and taught us in the past. I have right. to admit that in some of the stuff that I, that I am center that I find, it's pretty scary at times. I said, nevertheless, Lord, you are in control. If I die, I die. Never. If I die, I die in you. You know, like I have to have that faith and just keep on going. Right, because God, God's foreseen all of these things. Yet when we look at the possibilities of what's going to unfold, those possibilities, in a sense, are infinite. That is, what's going to happen and how it's going to unfold is in part uh, based upon the decisions that we make as a movement. Because Christ could have come ere this. If Christ had come in 1863, it would have been very different the, the the people involved, obviously, quite different, and the groups and the events and how that would have unfolded in Bible prophecy would have been very different than if Jesus were to come today, right? You know, so if Jesus could have come before, before there was computers and, and all all that stuff, and yet the prophecy is going to could have been fulfilled, then... It's not dependent upon the technology. It's not dependent upon however it unfolds, whether it's a cashless society or all those types of different things that people are worried about. I mean, we just don't know. And, and the Bible doesn't tell us that because those details are not necessary. Who those players are and how they move their, their chess pieces um, is immaterial to us because we can look back at the past and we can see how God led because we can look at those reform lines and th those reform lines can tell us what we need to do today, even though we don't know anything about the future. Because remember, God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Now, it gives us light for our feet. It doesn't show us the end. And what people always want to do, what our human nature wants to do, is we want to know everything that's going to happen so that we can plan for it, so that we can be ready for it. 
but we don't need to know everything that's going to happen so that we can be ready for it. We only need to know what we need to do today because God already foresees those things and he's leading us along that path. And we need to trust in him. And what ends up happening if we, if we take the story of the spies, for instance, that was brought up in earlier in one of our studies. Did they need to send in the spies to spy out the land? Did the Israelites need to do that? Yeah, I think we said that there is no need because God had God had promised that, that those tribes would, would have been conquered by him. He, he had already spied out the land. God had already spied yeah. it out, right? So, so for them to send in the spies themselves was really a lack of trust in God. So do we trust that God knows what's going to happen and that the reason he is giving us light is so that we know that we can know what he's wanting presently. How that's all going to unfold, trying to anticipate the future, uh, thinking that that's going to help us. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to see the giants, right? And, and we're going to give a false report. It's, it's not going to help us. So I know we spent a lot of time talking about that. But, but this is why we need to understand these lines. So we need to know what they, they're saying to us in this movement, which we believe that the story of the judges leads us to the upper room, that the present duty we have right now is repentance and confession. That's what we are supposed to be doing. Trying to now and, and in looking at Odilio, Odilio's line and Colin's line, what he's showing. Um, that, that is to show us our present duty. Now, we know that there's going to be a civil war in the United States. Ellen White plainly tells us that. We know there's going to be slavery. Ellen White tells us that. Uh, we know that there's going to be a conflict between the rich and the poor. Right the elites and, you know, the, the rabble, so to speak, how they would see us, right? The great unwashed, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so the question is not so much what's going to happen, but what is it that we are supposed to do? How is it that we are to be prepared? And so many people believe that being prepared knows means knowing what's going to happen in as much detail as possible. Uh, but we know that what prepares us is a character that no matter what happens, if we do not have a character of Christ, we won't be able to stand. And so we sort of mock the Adventist church because most Adventists don't, you know, they just think the Sunday law is going to come one day and, you know, and they will, they'll know what side to be on because they know stuff. Right. But knowing stuff isn't going to help you. It's going to be knowing Christ in an intimate way in your life every day, knowing his voice, having his strength and his power working in your life. That's going to um, give you at that moment the grace that you need so that you can endure whatever it is that's going to come. And if you don't have that, it doesn't matter if you knew exactly what was going to come and what was going to unfold and how it would unfold. If you didn't have that, it wouldn't matter. You would still be on the wrong side because you're making choices every day. And in this movement, we have made choices uh, that have been unchrist like And yet we expect that if we just know about what's going to happen, that we'll be able to stand there at that Sunday law. And, and we expect that Sunday law to come sooner than it really is going to come. But in some ways, for us who believe that's going to come sooner, it's going to come sooner. That is our close of probation 
question is going to come. If we cannot take up our present duty of repentance and confession. So, so let's look at, at uh, Judges 6 here. So the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So this is a period of strife. Midian represents strife. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was that when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east when they came up against them. Um, so we have the Midianites, we have the Amalekites, and what was the what is it behind the Amalekites that is significant? So they're uh, descendants of Amalek, Amalek, a grandson of Esau. So they basically descendants of Esau. <clears throat> and, and what is it about Amalek that uh, is important? Weren't they the first to attack the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt? Right. So they're the first ones to attack. And, of course, they, they sort of go at the back end of all the... Uh, they went after the weak and the infirm and the children. Right. So... So if we're going to understand this in the context of strife, and we're going to take Amalek, it is a, a backbiting spirit, so to speak, um, in the movement, right? Could we say that? We're going to use it as a symbol. That would be a good way of putting it. And now, now what about the children of the East, then? How would we look at that as a symbol? Well, if the Amalekites are the backbiting ones, the let's say the relations within the, the internal portion of, of the church, then are the children of the East, the external. Okay. So... Um... Now, now, we will often associate the children of the East with the descendants of Ishmael, don't we? Right. Okay. Um, right, so that, that would be Islam. But so when we look at this symbol, we say, well, it's a symbol of Islam, children of the East. But these are, are oppressing in this, in this example here. They're oppressing God's people. And, and if we think about Ishmael, I mean, this is, we can, we can even go all the way back to the idea of his mocking, the mockers, right? Because Ishmael mocked Isaac. Agreed. Okay. And, and I would say that that's part of what's happening, has happened in this movement. We've had this. The mockers, and these can be the people on the outside. So this movement is being oppressed, um, both within and without, right? But this 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 mocking spirit exists within this movement, and and so I would just say the, the children of sorry, Theodore, <clears throat> but I was thinking, could the children of the east also be those who have their faces to the sun and they're worshiping the sun? Well, they would actually have their backs to the sun if they're from the east. Okay, I was thinking they would be facing east, the rising sun. But if they're persecuting us, they got their backs to the east. But yeah, I understand. Okay. So, yeah. Let's, uh, let's remember yeah. the, major, the major symbol that Islam uses is the moon. Yeah. And Present, so, yeah. so the, the, the moon is reflective of the sun. They're not turning their 
their faces toward the sun, they have their back to the sun so that they can observe the moon. Yeah, though it is it is the crescent moon, but true, you know, which happens with the suns. But but yeah, so anyway, the way that I would look at this is this this is the mockers in this context, uh, dealing with the strife. So so we have um, the Midianites, which is strife, and then the Amalekites, which we had as the backbiters, and then the children of the East as the mockers. Right. And so this is the problem. This is the darkness that has uh, been oppressing this movement. And so the, the message of Gideon is meant to reform us from these things, right? To correct this movement. And so God gave us some very specific messages that were to uh, to release us from these attitudes. And these these were messages that related to the time. So now Jeff had already given a back um, a background or a foundation for what ended up happening in this movement. So when it talks about uh, this prophet that came, so they're impoverished, right? It's going to have all these symbols, but we're, uh, I don't want to go through it all again, but uh, they encamped against them, destroyed the increase of the earth till they came unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass, for they came up with the, their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. So we have another symbol of Islam. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So, I mean, we can see that this relates to this movement, but it, it relates to a larger degree to the church as well. Right. But this church has inherited something or the this movement has inherited something from the church. That is, this movement has actually in some ways been worse than the church in its persecution of its members. We've been, we, we could talk about how the church persecuted this movement, how it treated us when we believed in the 2520. But I believe the church gave us much more of a, uh, a fair dealing for the most part, than we've had within the movement itself. That is our ability to just take rumors and gossip and messages about people and to form views and ideas about what, what other people are doing or thinking, to judge their motives, and to shut them out of any part, any kind of discourse is, is much worse in this movement than it was with the church. So, so this is something we've inherited from those that we have criticized, because he that judges another man does the same things. We really have been of the same spirit as the church. And if we were in the power in the church, we would have treated people in the movement worse than the church did. Often it's um, that we weren't in power uh, and why we're in conflict with the church in the first place. Many people are in conflict with the church not because of what the church teaches, but because they're not part of the church. And there's a good re reason often why we're not part of the church. But this church has, has marginalized many people who are in this movement and have been in this movement. Marginalized those, pe marginalized those people because those people were very unchristlike in their attitude towards others. Even though they professed to believe something that was light, and would blame the church, they were often, uh, the church was less blame, blameless than them. 
So, so we've inherited these people who are self-righteous, judgmental, arrogant, um, critical, um, uh, controlling, all these types of things in this pretense that the church is the bad one and we're the good ones. And in reality, we're no better than the church. And we've shown that in this movement and how we've treated one another. So, so the church hasn't been reformed, but we need to be reformed. And if we are reformed, there will be a power in that that will be seen from those in the church who are seeking for truth and light. So this message of Jeff, we're going to say that he's the prophet here, though it is connected to the spirit of prophecy. So this isn't just about Jeff. This is about um, the spirit of prophecy that has given us this message that we will be delivered, right, out of, out of this oppression, just as we were delivered out of Egyptian bondage. And so... The call of Gideon is this call to this to Gideon who is struggling with the fact that they're under oppression. Right? So we say a mighty angel came down. That's Judges 611. And and so we we took this call of Gideon and we could place it as all as being the first angel's message. So we placed it on a line. So we're not going to go through all this again. Um, but we could draw this all as a single line. But in, in we, we have to simplify the story. That is, we have to look at not all of the details and make them way marks. Um, what we did is we took this story of, <clears throat> um, so we, we say that 9-11 is that event. So we're going to have a formalization of the message that happens. And then we're going to have an empowerment of the message that happens. So when we looked at this in, um, so I'll switch over here. We're not getting very far today, but I guess that's just the way it is. Um, so when we look at this line here, well, this is this is Judges chapter six, and so Judges chapter six, we're going to take, um, you know, this offering is prepared. This is the mighty angel comes down in Judges six eleven, which is also November 9th, 2019. And then we're going to have the June 21st, June 22nd. That's the formalization of the message. And then we have um, <clears throat> a Judges 627. <coughs> and and what, what we look at when we look at those verses, um, this is going to be the offering being accepted in Judges 621 and 22. And, and, and Gideon's going to perceive that it was the angel of the Lord, that it was Christ that he saw, right? And then in 627, um, there's going to be these 10 men, and they're going to get together. They're going to destroy this altar of Baal. <clears throat> so when we had, we had done these in this line, um, this is this we're going to have to line up with the empowerment so this is the 10 men being called to destroy the altar of Baal but if we're going to take this in this line um, all of this part in Judges 6 is going to have to be fulfilled so June 27th is going to be tying together um, all that's going to follow in Judges 6 so that, that is going to be the, uh, the trumpet that's going to be sounded, and all those different things. They're going to be all connected with this, this waymark, this June 27th waymark. So it's a symbolic waymark, but this is the empowerment of that message. And so that empowerment comes in the, that part of Judges chapter 6 that addresses the destroying of the altar of Baal and the sign of the fleece, right? So, and and I think one thing that we could say about June 27th 
is its connection to the sign of the police as well. Because what is it that we are doing in this, this history leading up to July 18, 2020, from even before June 27th, but especially from June 27th. In that 21 days, I made a call for fasting, right? Not, not literally fasting. I wasn't telling people they need to fast for three weeks. But this was, what was Daniel doing in his three weeks? What was his concern? Daniel chapter 10. It's, it's the same concern he has in, in Daniel chapter 9. What is Daniel looking for? Daniel 9 is a little bit more specific because he's, he's at the end of the 70 years for Babylon. But what is he concerned about? So he knows Babylon has fallen. And so why, what is he studying? He's, uh, yeah, he's wanting, he knows he's at the end of the 70 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's praying concerning people going back to Judea. Okay, so he wants to understand the 70 years period. Because he wants to know when they're going to be called out of Babylon, right? Yes. Because he, he understands, because in um, Daniel chapter 9, that's going to be in the first year of Darius. So that's the year just after Babylon falls. And then, and then he's in chap chapter 10. Is going to be the third year of Cyrus, so that's two years later, that he is um, mourning three full weeks. That's actually what it says. You know, so he's mourning or fasting. Um, so, so he's going to do that for three full weeks, and, and he's not going to eat any pleasant bread, neither have flesh or wine, um, and he's not going to anoint himself till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And then in the 420th day of the first month, as he's by the side of the great river Hittical, which is the Tigris, he's going to have this vision of Christ. Right. And, and what Christ is answering him is about what's going on in the mind of Cyrus in regard to this decree to release them so that they can now go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So, so Daniel here is, is trying to understand, he's trying to get a confirmation of something, right? Basically. So if we look at June 27th, 2020, what I was looking at is um, we need to study our lines and understand what's coming. We need to be sure, and, and we were given all kinds of signs, and symbols and information in that period affirming July 18, 2020. So if we if we could go back, I'm not going to do that right now because I don't remember everything. But there was all kinds of information that was being given to us that was affirming that date. And so as we keep approaching that date, we're finding more and more evidence that July 18th is solid. But at the same time, we also are being shown that it could be a failed prediction. But so I would I would liken that that uh, to that three weeks of fasting. Now, when we get to July 18th and the prediction fails, we actually are given the vision of Hiram Edson. That is, we already know we've we've been given the information to allow us to understand that even though our prediction failed, it isn't wrong. We weren't wrong. We just did not understand how that line was to unfold. Because July 18, 2020 does address Nashville. 
right? And the destruction that's going to come upon Nashville. It's just not going to come upon that date. Because we didn't understand everything about Nashville and what it symbolizes. And, and we were studying that up to that time, too. Um, because what does Nashville symbolize? What does what what is the purpose of understanding Nashville in Ellen White's uh, prophecy regarding the destruction of Nashville? What is it about? What is Nashville's sin? And it's not country music at that time. I don't think I would have gone there, but that's fine. I, I, uh, uh, no, what isn't it more the the elevation of self, especially in the erection of this temple and this uh, figurine? Okay, but why was that temple raised up? Why did they choose to go to um, to this symbol that comes from uh, well. The Well, I, I agree with what's been presented in the chat. The point is, this is the elevation of self that man's wisdom is greater than God's. And that's right. that's kind of the way the Greeks always approach these things. Right. So they were the Athens of the South, right? This was about the South. This was about slavery, right? Because Ellen White is fighting, because uh, Heidi and I are right now reading Testimonies, Volume 9, and lots of it deals with uh, uh, the work in the South. So, so the work and, and, and a lot of this is written like in 1905, 1906, 1907 in Testimonies Volume 9. Um, so, so that work's going on in the South. And, um, and, and she's going to have that, that vision in connection with the work in the South in Tennessee. And she's going to see the destruction of Nashville. Well, at least part of it, right? Whatever, whatever it is she's exactly seen, we're not certain, but it would be a, a judgment against Nashville. And that seems like a rather odd city to bring a judgment against if you were to talk about nowadays. Because nowadays you would think, well, what is Nashville? You know, that's um, you know, that's country music. You know, Tennessee's all about country music, Nashville and Memphis, and you know, we, we wouldn't think of it as this cultural center about education, right? But Nashville was about this place that had all these universities and that was educating people in really a philosophy of the world that was racist, right? Black people are inferior. At, now, we, we th much more think about the 19. 20s as being the time where you get this rise of um, uh, eugenics, right? People know what I'm talking about? I think it was prior to the 1920s. Yeah, but that's really the rise of it. I mean, that's the height of it, I think. I mean, you could say it goes even into, uh, but it's going to be it's going to rise in the 1920s. It's going to be popular because I can at least think in Canada, uh, the people, the famous uh, Canadians from that time, uh, some of them have been maligned now because, well, they believed in eugenics. Right. So but it's going to it's going to be here at the, at the beginning of the 20th century because of um, what had happened with Darwinism. Uh, you're going to have this belief that blacks are inferior. Right. And, and this, this is a very sophisticated and popular belief that, you know, we should sterilize um, uh, those who are inferior so that we don't, so that we can improve the genetic pool, so to speak, right? I mean, I don't know how many people are aware of all that history, but, uh, but yeah, it's going to start even, you know, even earlier. So part of that education in Nashville is this 
the superior superiority of the whites over the blacks. And, and this is an intellectual defense to what happened with the South losing the Civil War. Does that make sense? This, this yes, is one- It does, and it's a lot, it was much worse than what you're talking about. It wasn't right, just the black. I understand. Right, but, 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 but you see the point. I mean, this is just, this is not my analysis of that history. These are some people's analysis of Nashville and of uh, the Parthenon and, and why it was built, that it was actually a symbol of white superiority over blacks. That the South, even though they lost the Civil War, they were to be more cultured than the North. That's what they wanted to have. That, that, they, that they were correct in their understanding of the superiority of the white race over the Blacks. That's, that's what the Parthenon represents. That's, and that's what they were trying to celebrate in that World's Fair. Because that's why they built the Parthenon, was for the World's Fair in Nashville. Um, so, so if we try to understand this, uh, what's, what's happening with July 18th, that there is a, a message that, um, does here relate to, um, because when we look at this line, we say that one has to do with Adelia lines, Adelia's line, and one has to do with Trump's line. If if we're right, that's what we're saying about this. So if we're looking at the Parthenon itself as a symbol, um, and and its destruction is called for on July 18, 2020, then our understanding of that was is connected with this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. So does that help a little bit in understanding this line of Gideon that we see there, the first one? Now, now remember also, so when we say that this is a period of darkness, the darkness that, that exists then, that this first angel is in response to, uh, remember that darkness that preceded it was a spirit of criticism, judgment, so forth. And we can see how that can be manifested in the persecution of, of the blacks by the whites. But, but we also know that there's a teaching that's, that's just happened in the movement um, that led up to that division that occurred on November 9th, 2019. And that, that was the teaching, the woke understanding of Parminder and Tess. Now, wouldn't you think that that, that woke understanding is in accord with a message, right? I mean, on the surface, you know, Black Lives Matter. Right. Now, Black Lives Matter, of course, is not uh, a message that brings about uh, racial harmony. It's actually a call to war. Correct. Agreed. And, and, and of course, we could just see it, how it worked out. Black Lives Matter. What did they do? Did they do things that would try to bring unity? between whites and blacks? Not at all. Far from it. Yeah. So it actually creates, it's, you know, it's the, the race baiting, all that kind of stuff that, that happens in the United States that is just making things worse. It's not making things better. You know, it's, it's antithetical to what um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was doing. So, so this is this is just a new type of racism that, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, somebody who's a Canadian, that you know, 
America was improving, but with what what was happening with because uh, when Obama became president, it was like, oh, great, you know, a black guy was elected as the president of the United States. You know, racism is disappearing, and then we saw that it increased. That the media and all of the forces in the United States were instead of recognizing the victories that had been won, um, just created all this conflict. I don't fully understand it from any sort of logical point of view, but that's what happened. So we have this wokeism and we have Parminder's movement uh, telling me, you know, people in the movement telling me that I, I have white privilege and that if I don't acknowledge my white privilege, uh, then I'm a racist. You know, and I said, you know, I mean, Richard Coleman was one of them. And I'm like, you know, I'm the farthest thing from a racist you could expect. You know, never, never been racist at all. Um, but yet, you know, I'm a racist. So, so I could see that this type of thinking wasn't actually, I mean, it's, it's the thing that creates civil wars, right? It, it's, it's not, it's not very useful. But so anyway, we can look at what's happening with this 11.9, that this darkness is in a sense, this message that's really racist, but it has to be undone. So we can see the parallel between the history of the Civil War in 1863 and the, the North and the South. And we can see this uh, philosophical battle going on between these ideas, that really these ideas of Parminder and Test are really racist ideas. So the Democrats, of course, were the racist ones in 1863, and they still are, right? The Democrats have been the racist since the time of Andrew Jackson. Yeah, which is, when was Andrew? 1820s. Okay, so. Yeah, so, and they still are. I mean, even the whole thing of, you know, Black Lives Matters, I mean, it's it's looking down upon, you know, the whole idea that the Blacks are oppressed and that we're going to to help them. Of course, they never help them. They, they do more damage to uh, Black communities by their policies. And... And so those policies are really meant, they're, they're really a looking down upon that group of people as if they're unable to care for themselves. It's just the way, the same way the elites look at everyone else, you know, where we're of no value, right? We're just um, uh, eaters and breeders, right? We're destroying the earth. And the less there are of us, the better off the world is, right? So there's, yeah, it's it's, it's a long, complicated story, right, to understand this. Because we're talking about very complicated histories and very broad brushes. So so we're going to pick this up again tomorrow. Um, but uh, uh, so I want people to think about these things in between how we're going to look at this line. But I, I can see that June 27th, we, there's lots of, ways we've, we've, lots of ways that we've connected it with this empowerment, but it has to do with a light that um, confirms what we were do, what we were predicting July 18th. But when we get to uh, the arrival of that, that, that's chapter seven. So we're gonna have to look at that and finish off chapter six a little bit. Okay, so any final comments before we close with prayer? Not for me. Okay. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the study this morning. And we just pray that you can be with us throughout this day. May your angels watch over us, guide and direct us and keep us. Help us to follow and serve you. We pray and ask. Ask in Jesus' name. Amen.